All right. So uh, thanks for having me. I'm super excited to uh, talk to you all about some of the work that we've been doing in um, not just prediction, but also thinking about how we can um, intelligently incorporate um, different modes of inference. Um, and specifically when I say inference, um, in many ways prediction is just a different type of inference, but more how we can start really looking at the human, looking at how they behave, seeing if we can infer some other parameters or some other things that might be informative when we start looking at prediction. Um, and then in turn, how we can actually think about how we can turn this into a decision-making problem. So we can actually look at how to use these predictions, use this human insight to inform safe um, interaction. So today we'll mostly be talking about some of our work around prediction um, in this space. Um, and then we'll talk about a few, few applications. Um, and most of the work that I'll be presenting today uh, We'll see if I can squeeze in a little bit more. Um, but most of the work I'll be presenting today is led by one of my PhD students, uh, Joe Wong. All right, so let's get into it. All right, so if I wanted to start um, basically thinking about how I can formulate a problem for safe interaction, one of the things I could do is I could start really thinking about um, robust decision-making control frameworks. And one of the nice things about these frameworks is it kind of gives me a way to start thinking about all the different things a human could do. And again, help me find a way to control my robot to enable safe, um, safe interactions or whatever properties that I'm, I'm looking for. So if I wanted to say control a robot, despite these sort of human uncertainties and all these human disturbances, um, I would first start with some model um, of my robot. There's the input that I want to try to find, or this is the thing I want to um, uncover to control that robot. And then I could basically just cast everything else that is unmodeled or all the things that could happen with that interaction with that human as a disturbance. So I could basically have something, this thing that I'm adding to my dynamics to try and capture all the things a human can do. So if I can formulate it this way and I can solve this control problem, then I can basically have safe interaction. Um, and originally this uh, type of formulation was really, uh, really came about um, for things like um, sensor noise or environment uncertainty. So this is sort of where it was originally formulated um, and more recently has become very popular uh, because we've been looking at things like model mismatch. So you have some um, things you can model in simulation um, and some things that you can't model that actually happen in the real world. Um, interaction is one thing that you could cast this as. Um, so this sort of formulation has really sort of taken hold as we started to start looking at things like model mismatch and all this sort of uncertainty or things that we just can't model. Um, and while this works for some things, and this again is sort of the, the baseline when we start thinking about robustness and safety and whatnot, um, but it really doesn't capture things like these long term. Other things. Things. And the real question is are you happy for a system to be adaptive? And is an adaptive system ever possibly safe? If the answer to that is yes, then maybe there are ways to constrain learning such that it respects everything else we understand about adaptive systems. If, on the other hand, we're saying that the application simply has no room for adaptation at all, then learning is part of that as well. It should not be used. Okay, a quick aside on adaptive something. <laughs> All right. Okay, but um, both that and basically this framework uh, often doesn't really take into account these long term interactions. And again, it doesn't sort of explicitly take into account some of the structure and some of the things that we can extract directly from that human. Um, so again, my impression of the purpose of this workshop is again to really sort of look at these longer term interactions and really think about how we can take these insights from that human and hopefully have um, uh, better informed decision making and again, hopefully safer and better interaction. So we'll be sort of specifically looking at these sort of longer term interactions and then thinking about how we can sort of tie that, tie that in more directly. Um, and as I mentioned um, before, um, one of the things that um, we'll talk a little bit more about in this talk is really thinking about how we can start sort of incorporating um, some other parameters or some other insights about the human into prediction to hopefully, again, better inform um, predictions and these sort of down, downstream tasks. And as sort of a quick, um, a quick motivation for this, 
Um, if we look at some sort of nominal, uh, sort of simple interactive scenario. So in this um, video, what we're going to see is we're going to see this robot. It is performing some, some task. It's moving through um, this workspace that's in this blue square. And we'll have a human that's going to be uh, moving around it. And if we wanted to just have a system that was very safe, every time this human entered, um, entered into the space, we could stop the robot. Um, and this is how we can guarantee safety. I'm in one line here. So if we show this interaction, the robot stops every time this human sort of enters, enters this zone. Um, and this is something that is nice because it sort of uh, is safe by design um, and whatnot. But what we can see here is we um, have a system that is very safe. It is stopping whenever the human um, enters this zone, um, but it isn't very um, interactive. So we're not really doing anything that actually utilizes the sort of collaboration or the human and, and the robot together. Um, the other thing is we'll also see um, there's a sort of trade off when we start thinking about safety, um, not just with how interactive we can be, but also with um, efficiency. Um, so as this human starts moving faster, it's basically this robot is always going to be stopped. It's going to be basically deadlocked in this place. So we're not able to really actually do anything because we have this sort of very strict um, sort of safety requirements here. So there's um, sort of this nice coupling and trade offs that we can start thinking about when we think of robots as being interactive, when we're trying to encode safety, and when we want to try to actually maximize um, efficiency in completing um, some task. So uh, again, one of the things that we're hoping for is by incorporating these predictions of the human, we can hopefully maintain some of these safety um, properties while improving interaction and also making the overall task um, more efficient. Um, and this isn't something that is exclusive to, to this sort of setting. Um, you can also say similar things about autonomous driving, where maybe you're not uh, making explicit inferences about um, things like motion, but understanding types of behaviors can help inform when you should make decisions and sort of avoid things like deadlocks when you're trying to, say, navigate uh, a complex um, intersection. Okay, so again, so in this talk, we're going to be talking about a few different things um, in here, mostly looking at how we can start, again, inferring these parameters so we can do some cooler stuff uh, than this. So today, um, the first thing we're going to be talking about is how can we actually predict this human motion? And again, taking in some of these ideas from inference, um, that can help us um, inform planning. And if we have time, we'll see how fast I can talk. Uh, we might also get um, look into some other fun um, topics, uh, looking at inference tools um, for understanding things like occlusions um, and our environment understanding. But again, for the most part, we are going to be focusing on this um, prediction piece uh, today. All right, so let's um, jump in. So first off, um, uh, I know I'm preaching a little bit to the, the choir here, but typically when we think about motion prediction, we can kind of categorize it into um, two, different, two different classes. Um, so first we have the sort of physics-based or model-based um, approaches. Um, where basically we have some system, some dynamical system, we either try to estimate that system um, or we make some assumptions and add that structure into it. And we try to basically fit some parameters so we can understand um, something that kind of fits, fits some form like this. Um, this is nice because it gives us a lot of structure. We kind of understand sort of what's, what's going on, um, what's going on uh, in this sort of system. Um, on the other hand, we have things like pattern-based methods or learning-based approaches. Um, we're, we're kind of, uh, we still learn basically the same thing. We're still trying to learn some function that can tell us what our next state is going to be, but we're going to be looking more through data to try and find patterns um, and predict what's going to happen in the future um, based, um, based on that. Um, and often when you are looking at papers in this, or you're looking into this area, you kind of see these uh, fairly separate approaches. Um, you kind of take one side or another. Um, and there's sort of this, this split um, here. And one of the things we're going to try and do in the work that we'll be talking about is trying to see if we can take the best, best of both worlds and kind of merge everything together to get some insight and hopefully um, better predictions down, down the road. Um, the other thing that really helps inform um, predictions, um, as I've been sort of hinting at quite a bit, um, is intent or some of these sort of internal goals and the motivations of, of the human. So um, at a high level, um, typically us as people, when we are observing people moving through space, um, we don't really actually care about the exact X, Y position that everyone is taking. So when we observe, we kind of uh, are extracting and sort of thinking about things in a, in a higher level. 
Um, so we typically call these um, sort of higher level um, understandings or observations and tensions. And this really helps determine how we understand, how we recall, so how we sort of remember what people actually did, react, and how we predict um, human agents um, around us. And, um, so again, um, and in general, when uh, you do things like observe continuous motions, so again, like trajectories or motions of different agents, um, while some things might sort of differ between people, in general, we're actually very good at identifying separating uh, bounding lines between things. And these typically um, can correspond to intent. And I don't have a video playing. Imagine there's a cool video of lane changing happening right here in the corner. Um, but a simple example of this is lane changing. Um, we can separate these into two different actions, say lane keeping and lane changing. And we can sort of all agree that there is sort of a typical boundary where we sort of switch between these different modes of behavior. We can correspond these to intent. So we can think of intent as these high level actions that we're carrying out, or we can think of them as these goals. But in general, we want to sort of think about how we can incorporate intent, sort of understanding that motivation or sort of what is pushing the person to again, help improve um, our predictions down the road. Um, so in the case of um, sort of our predictions, so we're going to look at this case of where we're trying to understand how pedestrians or people will move through space. So let's say we observe a person walking through some space, um, and nominally, if I were just to sort of make a uninformed decision, I might do something like this. Um, in general, people like moving in straight lines. We like being relatively efficient. So this is a reasonable prediction here. But now if again, I start thinking about how I can incorporate things like intense, maybe I can consider um, different goals at different levels of intention or different intents that the person might take, then the types of predictions that I would come up with would vary drastically. So if I can start incorporating these into my prediction, I can again, hopefully come up with much better uh, and longer term um, predictions. So we're going to basically look at two problems. So the first is how do we actually infer intent? And two, how do we actually use this to predict a future trajectory? So again, one of the things we're trying to push is inference tools. So we're going to basically look at this um, sort of big plot or a big uh, diagram where we can try and sort of look at each of the different pieces, which hopefully will help us incorporate this insight from the people and get better, um, better predictions on the road. So um, we're going to look at this as a way we can simultaneously infer these goals while we're generating trajectories. So we're going to do this with a particle filtering framework, which nominally is not that different from uh, any other particle filtering framework, but we assign these different particles to have different intents. So each particle has a different goal. And what we want to do is we want to sort of take some observation and try and see which, uh, which um, uh, particles, which are going towards a particular goal, um, actually match what we observe um, that human, um, actually observe that human doing. And we can basically update our particle weights and hopefully then infer um, or have a better idea of which intent is the most likely one based on what we're, we're observing up here. So you can basically come up with a new um, distribution and nominally sort of this would um, help us make this inference. So there's a few things to note here. So one, to actually do this, we already need to have some sort of predictive model or something that can sort of generate or propagate those particles forward. So first, let's just assume that I have that sort of trajectory prediction piece already worked out. I can already sort of get us to where, where we're going. Um, so just bear with me now. Um, and again, now we're just focusing on, on intent. So now I can uh, basically do this. And one of the big problems though, is typically people don't have a single goal um, that they have for all time. We typically have um, changing decisions. Sometimes we make mistakes. Um, or we have misleading behaviors. Um, so one of the key things we added um, to this framework was this idea of mutation. So sometimes we can have some mutating uh, particles that will change their intent. And this is actually really important for basically keeping some liveness um, in the different possible goals or the different things that we could basically have that, that human doing. Um, okay, so again, assuming I have uh, this uh, generative model that can produce these forward predictions, I can simultaneously have some predictions um, and some intention um, probability distribution. So let's um, take a look um, at what this sort of would look like in action. So again, before I have those three goals that I'm looking at, and I assign some probability to them based on the particles, and these will help me sort of generate these trajectories that get me toward my goal. So based on basically what I've observed thus far, 
we can play this forward and we can see we can actually sort of move towards and have a good estimation and prediction of where we're going um, here. And like I mentioned, we have some of this like sort of mutation properties. And what this basically does is this means we never have um, our particles dying out. So we never have any um, intention going to probability zero. So when the human suddenly decides to go to a different goal, which should happen here in just a moment, Right there, <laughs> we can actually sort of recover and we can actually get on to our goal and we um, can maintain this probability. All right. Um, and again, this is just sort of a plot. If you didn't have that, um, that mutation parameter, basically you have some, um, some intentions or some things would just die out and you basically would be able to recover if you did things like change intentions or again, we're just misled by some, um, some behavior. Um, but since we have this mutation, we always have some probability that we could be wrong or that you could be just sort of moving into a different direction. Um, and the videos I've been showing um, show a very simplified view saying there's just three very separate goals. But this is something that can generalize as you sort of discretize the boundaries or potential goals. It does generalize quite well to these sorts of um, settings. All right. So back to this sort of main figure. Um, so, okay, we've incorporated some inference tools so we can now infer uh, intention with um, pretty good success. Um, now, again, we need to get to that prediction part. Okay, so now let's assume that we have the um, intention piece and now we're trying to get, um, get some reasonable and again, long-term predictions um, out. So um, again, one of the things that we're trying to push for in this work is trying to combine different tools from model-based approaches and learning-based approaches. And one way we can do that is basically by trying to build off of some nominal model. So again, we have some observations of a human motion. And let's say we know our intent, because again, in our framework, we already know, or we assume we have some sort of given intent, and now we need to find, um, find a prediction. Um, so we're going to use um, a fairly common approach um, using generalized potential fields. And basically what this is going to do is it's going to allow us to easily basically generate a bunch of sources um, that can basically be um, obstacles that we want to avoid, sinks that will represent these goals, in this case, our intentions. So basically give us a nice, um, simple model um, that can guide us to, to our goal. So the nice thing about this is it's a linear model. For the most part, it works very, very nicely. Um, and again, this is something that you can fit and sort of tune to match real world data. But again, it's sort of a nice structured prediction and it kind of is intuitive, right? If I know where I want to go, maybe I'll walk in a straight line towards that or more or less um, avoiding obstacles. And again, while this seems like a reasonable prediction, um, especially if I told you where this person was going, it's quite possible that you would um, guess something like this um, as well. It doesn't seem very human-like. So it's kind of lacking some of the nuances of human behavior. And that's where some of these pattern-based approaches or learning-based approaches can kind of come into play um, there. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, um, let's say we have some ground truth. We'll say the um, agent is going to walk like this. If we're working with that potential field approach or so social forces, we'd probably get something like a straight line, assuming there aren't many um, obstacles, as in this case. Um, and again, it's not really capturing the nuanced motion um, of, of human behavior. So if we were to just take learning-based approaches, one of the things learning-based approaches are typically not good about doing is really taking into account those constraints. So even if we give the goal region or give that intent, we're probably going to have some drift. Um, so it's not really going to get us where we need to go or where we know that human is going to be moving to. However, it does seem to capture that sort of nuanced motion and it does sort of look a little bit more realistic. So again, what we want to try and do is see if we can actually merge these two together. So we're going to introduce a warping method that basically is going to take in that nominal prediction and then try to push it closer to that sort of more nuanced, more natural human, human motion up here. Um, and so basically, this is a little bit different from typical prediction methods. So often in predictions, we look at things like displacements. So we'll look at offsets between different prediction points in time. And this is good because it helps basically unify sort of the distribution of what our output is trying to be. Um, but instead, we're going to, again, look at this offset um, here. So we're going to take in some nominal prediction and, again, try to sort of push it towards um, that uh, true, true behavior. Um, 
through the sorting process and whatnot. And again, one thing that we find is it typically does a really good job of trying to make that data or that output um, or this offset sort of look a little bit more, a uh, little bit more uniform. Um, and it's typically a little bit easier to, to predict. Um, so as you can kind of tell, this fits really nicely into a residual um, learning method. So again, we take in that nominal prediction and we're basically just learning these, these offsets. And again, one of the really nice things about sort of being able to cast this as a residual learning framework is it tends to have a little bit more of the stability properties and it's a little bit easier to train than some other nominal um, or more traditional approaches. So it fits very nicely into those approaches and again, typically does, um, does quite nicely. Okay, so um, when we actually look um, at the prediction results, um, some things aren't um, too surprising. We are able to capture sort of that end um, end goal really well, since we are taking that sort of, uh, we know where the end point is, and we're constantly sort of updating um, where we think the person is going. And we are able to capture that sort of nuanced human motion because we're sort of learning those typical behaviors through, through the learning method. So we able are in general to do, um, to do very well. Um, the other thing that's nice about this is um, while we are predicting this sort of distribution of trajectories, um, we have this sort of nice way to basically um, figure out which set or which um, trajectories within that distribution actually are more likely since we have these particles that have weights associated with them. So we can actually say sort of of this distribution, which ones do I pick and how do I sort of pick them um, in a way that's a little bit more principled than just like taking the mean or the average of all the results. So in, typical, uh, in general, this um, works quite nicely um, in practice. And again, we can basically show that by simultaneously estimating this intent or inferring something about that human and incorporating this into our predictions um, does, um, does quite well um, in practice. Okay, so one of the things um, I promised is that we would get to safe interaction. So um, what's nice about this framework is it is very general. You actually don't need to just apply this to things like pedestrians walking through a space, but we can use this for things like um, helping plan for collaborative robots, where we can both infer low level goals of that human. So like where the different parts are, where that human hand is going to be moving. Again, and similar tools um, as we talked about before, but we can also incorporate um, other um, different types of intention. For example, some higher level um, intents, like if the person just wants to sort of be in the same space or actually cooperate with the robot. So it's a very generalizable approach that you can use for many different, um, different approaches or different methods. Um, the other thing that you can do is um, fit, uh, fit this quite nicely um, into different frameworks like autonomous vehicles. So in this case, um, if you have your full autonomous vehicle stack, um, say you have all of your sensor data, you have something that can track and detect um, everyone that's around you, you can fit this into basically that behavior modeling component of your vehicle. You can connect this to other tools um, like reachability analysis, which can help keep you safe. Um, and then you can help this to basically help make um, more safe decisions for your vehicle, um, where again, we are using that same framework that we talked about before, where we have this um, inference tools and prediction and reachability to understand where the vehicle could go, um, given all the different, um, different uncertainties in, in the world. So then you can basically do things like infer whether or not this pedestrian, which is me, <laughs> is going to be crossing the street or not, how they're going to move, and you can do things like decide when you should go and when you should stop um, the vehicle here. All right, so um, again, I'm basically very close to time, so we won't um, get to this uh, next uh, section here, and I'm going to skip I'm not in presenter mode, so I'm just going to have to go through the, the things really fast. So I apologize really quick as I go through all these things that we won't talk about. Okay. One more. All right. So again, today we uh, only basically talked about how we can predict um, human motion. But again, the big takeaway is um, incorporating different things and different insights from that human can be very important and figuring out basically resilient methods for incorporating that both into prediction and then the downstream tasks can really help inform things like um, in 
forming safe interaction. And again, hopefully having really good deployment as we um, move out and sort of actually get these robots out in the world and um, working with people. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge all of my students. And again, in particular, Joe Huang, who uh, was the lead author on this work um, and all of my sponsors. So with that, thanks for your time and I'll take some questions. Yes. Thank you for a great talk. Uh, really probably short question. How flexible is this method? Is it possible to include a lot of semantic information to improve the prediction, or is it like sort of rigid and it's difficult to add more to what we have seen here? So for the most part, the, the hardest part about adding semantic um, information, so it's not hard for the general framework. Um, it, the, the toughest thing is as you add more semantic information and even just add more layers or like levels of intent, for example, or things like that, um, it, does, uh, it does require more data since you basically need to learn a generative model for each of these discrete modes. Um, so you can, although you just need to be able to have a good source for generating that sort of sort of data. But in general, it's, it's like any filtering framework, it is very generalizable and whatnot. So ideally, yes. Yeah. Yes. I can repeat the question if that's easier. Yeah. Uh, what is the metric of uh, saying that particular trajectory is more nuanced or do you mean like there is other things? I give you two examples. So the, the question was, if uh, what is the metric or what is the approach for saying one trajectory is more human like or more nuanced um, than, than another? Um, that's a great question. I'm sure many people have lots of opinions about that. <laughs> the metric that we use might not actually capture that, but if you have the true data, you assume that is a uh, human like, um, and you do some like L2 error or minimum offset error or something like that. So there are sort of standard approaches. And actually, I think in the benchmark discussion, I'm assuming people will talk about metrics there. <laughs> so, so there are some standard ones that, again, I think you'll learn about in three talks or something like that, two talks. Um, so that's the, um, the sort of deflective answer. In general, though, I think there the, the metrics that we have aren't necessarily very good at necessarily saying like, is this human like, um, is it more nuanced than another? And a lot of times it sort of comes up to uh, an eyeball test in some sense. So, yeah. I think, I don't think there's any new questions. Your Zoom, do you have any questions? No? Um. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.